Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily. On today's episode, we're going to talk about the best films that Jacob Hall saw at Fantastic Fest 2018. This is Slash Film Editor-in-Chief Peter Serretta. And joining me on today's episode is Slash Film Managing Editor Jacob Hall. Hello, hello. So, uh, you know, the last two weeks you have been at Fantastic Fest in Austin, Texas. This is the annual genre film festival, which I've heard described as kind of like a uh, uh, almost like a summer camp for movie geeks. Like uh, yeah, I used to go to this thing and you camp out in the Alamo Draft House all day and you, you eat uh, food and watch uh, movies that range from uh, great sci-fi and genre you know horror films to things that probably won't get distribution anywhere or be yeah. seen anywhere else <laughs> it's definitely a grab bag of of especially over the years it's grown to have be more inclusive of it's about everything and this year it had hosted major premieres major studio movies but also had experimental Chilean stop motion horror movies about the holocaust so you know <laughs> anything between those two far um Pillars is what you get at Fantastic Fest. Okay, you saw 28 movies at this year's Fantastic Fest, which is I did. a lot of movies to, to see. I don't think most people, prob- probably even those movie geeks that listen to this podcast, probably even see 30 movies in a year. I could be wrong. But, um, uh, you know, let's, let's talk about the best of the best. Um, what is the best film that you saw at this year's Fantastic Fest? Oh, the, the best film I saw that's best. I thought we were going to work our way up there, but let's just start the best. Oh, uh, oh should uh, you know, you know what? Yeah, you're right. Let's build towards it. Let, let's okay. Let's let people sit through the you know. Uh, let, let's let's uh, yeah. Let's build towards it. Yeah, this this is good. Uh, let, let's start. Um, uh, let's talk about your. What are we going to do? Like your top fifteen, I guess. Yeah, I went ahead and, uh, and scrambled together top fifteen. Uh, I'd say. Out of the 28 movies I saw, maybe 20 of them were movies worth seeing. So everything in this top 15 is a movie I recommend that you see. Yeah. So this is the you know the top half of the movies you have seen. Uh, okay. Let's start with uh, Lords of Chaos, I guess. Yeah. Lords of Chaos. It, uh, it's a new film by director Jonas Eckerland. And it is a true crime story that I was unfamiliar with entirely, but people at the fest uh, knew about. So they were excited about it and creeped out by it and ready for it. And I was not ready for it. It is set in the early 90s. And it's about the birth of Norwegian black metal, the uh, heavy metal genre or subgenre, which is about creating the most evil music imaginable. So it's these uh, <laughs> young kids, uh, long black hair, black outfits, and it starts off with them sort of being like, I worship Satan. I'm going to yell at old people in the streets. I am evil. He's my evil music. And, and it follows the growth of this genre. It's getting more popular. And it is uh, grown by Euronymous, the name for the, uh, the, the 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 fake name for Rory Culkin's character. Rory Culkin plays the guy who found who found Norwegian black metal, and he doesn't really put on much of a Norwegian accent, but it's still a very good performance. And what ends up happening though is as he talks about being evil, and as he finds more outcasts, including a band member who cuts himself on stage and later commits suicide, um, people start realize so people start seeing this form of music as a place to one up each other and the true crime of it comes in when arson gets involved when there's murder when there's uh threats when there's um planned terrorist attacks all these dorks all these <laughs> dorks in black leather and long black hair are trying to one up each other and being evil to the point where things get really dark in really horrible ways and the film uh, doesn't really shy away from this. You know, you may remember, you remember the scene, Peter, in uh, David Fincher's Zodiac, where the camera kind of sits there and we see a murder happen yeah. in one long shot. This movie How has can scenes you like that. that? <laughs> yeah, it's, this movie gets that dark. The murders in this movie are awful. They are truly heinous to witness. And if you're a true crime buff, uh, if you like, you know, those really so insane, they're true crime stories, where Lords of Chaos goes is insane. <laughs> I don't think it works as well as it should. There's some moralizing in the end, and after reading up a little bit online about where, where these people actually went, I feel it kind of pulls its punches in some ways. Uh, and there's a good Phyllis-esque narration that I don't think quite works as well as it does. Hmm. But in terms of being this portrait of a time and place, which is Oslo, Norway, and the uh, Norwegian black metal scene, and the crimes that are committed therein, it is really captivating stuff. Uh, does this film have distribution, do you know? It does. Uh, Gunpowder and Sky, I believe, picked it up. It's not sure if, when it's coming out, but you will have a chance to see it. Very cool. Uh, let's move on to your second movie, which is a film 
I didn't think we would ever actually get to see on a big screen. Tell us about it. Yeah, this is Terry Gilliam is the man who killed Don Quixote. And if you're like me and you're a big Terry Gilliam fan, you've been following this one for 20 years, back when it was uh, originally, cameras rolled on it originally in 1998, and that production fell apart disastrously. And there's a documentary called Lost in La Mancha that chronicles it. And for years, there have been rumors of it getting false starts, of it getting funding, losing funding, casting actors, losing actors. And this is the version that got made. This is the version that, with Amazon Studios' help, got funding then lost its distribution, is now inv- involved in all kinds of legal battles. So I do not know when you get a chance to see this movie. But I think you will at some point, and it, I liked it a lot. And I can see why maybe some people weren't as into it as I was. The reaction at the fest was a little lukewarm. Uh, but the gist of this movie is that Adam Driver plays a jaded commercial director working on a campaign in Spain, sort of a, a, a uh, energy, I think it's said it's like an energy company's Don Quixote-inspired um, advertising campaign and while leaving the set for a break he runs into an actor he had cast in a student film adaptation of of the novel Don Quixote years earlier and this man played by Jonathan Price has gone insane thinks he's Don Quixote and drags the director into his various adventures and if you're a Gilliam fan it, it follows his usual tropes as he, he trots out all the themes he usually likes the idea of that dreams are fragile, uh, are fragile prisons easily broken, but they keep us safe and and and, and or trap us. The idea of fantasy and insanity being two halves of the same coin. Uh, also, at the same time, lots of slaps at humor, lots of body humor, lots of uh, middle finger raised at the industry type satire. It's definitely a full meal of Gilliam. <laughs> and at the same time, there is there's a sense of finality to it. Gilliam is 77 years old. He spent 20 years trying to make this movie, and it's ultimately a very sad movie. It's about the idea of when you die, when it, do your stories die with you? Does somebody pick up the torch and carry on, you know, not just your characters, but the idea of the idea of what that you're trying to get across in your art. And Adam Driver in the lead here is spectacular. It's my favorite performance in a Gilliam movie since Robin Williams in The Fisher King. Oh, wow. And he's silly and he's hilarious, but he's also very soulful. And I feel like Adam Driver tends to get cast as super intense guys a lot, but he's so funny here. He has some of the funniest moments of Fantastic Fest, and when you get to see this movie, you get to see a side of Adam Driver that I really hope more directors tap into. Um, you know, you're you're really selling me on this movie, which I hadn't heard great things about, but this is kind of low on your list, so I don't... Um, are you You are recommending this, but it's not... What do you think? Like, did this meet your expectations? I know you've been following this for many years. My expectations were, if it exists, <laughs> I want to see it. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, if you want to break down the numbers, uh, I'd give it a seven point five out of ten. I think everything in my top fifteen here is a good movie. Manga Don Quixote is a very good Terry Gilliam movie. It's my favorite movie of his since Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas twenty years ago. It is not a masterpiece. It's not like a great movie. I didn't walk out seeing its praises. It's messy in the way that Gilliam can be these days. Yeah. But I feel like the ideas on display work. Adam Driver is so good. And I feel like, especially if you're a Gilliam fan, if you understand the kind of movies he makes and the messages he finds important, what's here will strike a chord with you. And I think if you go in blind, if you think, oh, a new Adam Driver movie, you may not appreciate it. But if you know what you're in for, if you see it as the summation of everything Gilliam has been trying to say since his Monty Python days, I think it's a very powerful experience. Well, very cool. Uh, the next film on your list is a movie that I think a lot of our listeners want to hear about, and that is the new Halloween film. Yeah, David Gordon Green's Halloween. It's so much fun. Uh, it's not scary. If you want like a, an ultra scary horror movie, this is not what David Gordon Green is delivering here. He's delivering a really good time with the movies. And he's delivering a Gordon Green, a David Gordon Green movie. I was surprised how much this w- felt like his work. I mean, as you may know, it's a direct sequel to the original Halloween, John Carpenter's classic. And it ignores all the sequels. It's set 40 years later. Jamie Lee Curtis is back as a now older, uh, unhinged Laurie Strode, who's, pre- who's been preparing for 40 years for Michael Myers to escape from captivity and come wreaking havoc again. And it's not a spoiler to say that he does. But <laughs> what I like about this movie is all the David Gordon Green touches. Um, there's like a really good eye for high school life. Kids talk like kids. 
there's some good stoner jokes even. Um, that's a really good small town vibe that Michael Myers just crashes into and just brutalizes. So it's almost like if you had removed Michael Myers entirely, you have this really good small town dramedy that David Gordon Green would make any other year. Instead, he lets John Carpenter invade it. And Michael Myers is, is like this force of nature in it. The movie's incredibly violent. Um, the score, it's a redone version of the classic score by, by John Carpenter and a few other collaborators, is spectacular. There's some new cues in this movie that I, I think are on par with anything Carpenter's ever done music-wise. And ultimately, and I, I, what I was most surprised by is that this is not a movie about where you enjoy the slashing killing and that's it. It's a movie about shared trauma, about how Laurie Strode has passed down the trauma of what happened to her in 1978 to her daughter and to her granddaughter, and how these women must come together to defeat this faceless evil that has tormented their family for years. It's ultimately almost a metaphor for women standing up for the trauma that is that is generational and that, that has hurt them and in ways that they that can't be easily defined to other people. The people who want to write it off as something like, why don't you get over it? It happened years ago. And the movie directly confronts that and says, you know, when people are hurt, when people are traumatized, it's not something you shake off. It's something that you carry with you for the rest of your life. And Halloween actively explores that, even as it's delivering this really fun, exciting horror movie. That is really cool. I am so excited to see this film. I'm actually, this is another movie that I'm, you know, after hearing you talk about it, I'm actually kind of surprised it's not higher up on your list. Look, I saw some really good movies these past two weeks, Peter. <laughs> I, making this list was agonizing. Okay, let's talk about the next film, and that is May the Devil Take You. Yes, this is an Indonesian film by, uh, I'm going to try to pronounce the name correctly. I hope I get it right. Uh, Timo Tahanto. Uh, he's, he's been up to this fest before. He directed, uh, he co-directed Safe Haven, the uh, VHS 2 short he co-directed with Gareth Evans, which is an incredible short. He directed the action movie Headshot, which is pretty good. But May the Devil Take You is him stepping up onto a new level. He's very open about this being his riff on Evil Dead. This is him doing Sam Raimi. But it's such a great Evil Dead riff. It is taking all the things you love about Sam Raimi, that goofy humor, the extreme violence, the uh, inventive camera work, and it's dialing up in a way that I think most American filmmakers simply have not been these past few years. And it is a very simple story. A man sells his soul to the devil. The devil comes to collect and wreaks havoc on his family in their isolated country home. So it's this family of, of misfits, like daughter from a first marriage, kids from a second marriage, teaming up to fight against a demon that's popping out of places and tormenting them and possessing them. And this, is a, this movie's a wild ride. It is like the it is like the highest energy moments of the Evil Dead stretched to two hours. It, it never really lets up. And it just it, – the high energy, it, when it does slow down, it's, it so can be scary. But when it's not just screaming in your face <laughs> in the most creative ways imaginable, it has sequences that are as tense and as frightening and as deliberate in their setup as any other horror movie I've seen recently. I mean, it's not – it's not it's not high art. I don't think Timo Tato <laughs> makes high art here, but he makes killer popcorn movies. And May the Devil Take You is it's a better Evil Dead remake than Evil Dead remake. It is so much fun. Now, uh, this being an Indonesian film, I'm kind of cynical that this is going to get a you know wide release. Uh, can people expect to see this somewhere? Do do we this know? This is what I'm curious about. It, it is very accessible for an Indonesian film, and. Timo Tonto had two two films at Fantastic Fest this year, one of which you'll hear about in a bit. That one was picked up by Netflix. So I'm really, really hoping, cross my fingers, that Netflix realizes that they could program some great Indonesia genre film double features if they uh, pick this one up. Very cool. Okay, let's move on to the next film, and that is Apostle. Uh, yeah, Apostle is Gareth Evans' movie. Speaking of Gareth Evans, who also co-directed Safe Haven with Timo Tonto, uh, he's most known for directing The Raid and The Raid 2. And Apostle is a very big left turn for him. It is a horror movie inspired by 60s and 70s British cult movies. And cult meaning literally, as in a uh, group of people on an island worshiping a pagan deity, uh, wreaking havoc on those who visit type movies. And Apostle is, it is a ton of fun. It's not as good as the Raid movies. It's not even trying to be the Raid movies. It stars Dan Stevens as a man who comes from a wealthy family whose sister is kidnapped by a cult and held for ransom. So he uh, infiltrates the cult and tries to get to the bottom of things and rescue her. 
and things do not go well or they go easily. The movie tips his hand very early at their, that this cult is not just some backwoods group trying to um, uh, con its members. There actually is supernatural going on on this island. The cult is worshipping actual god on this island. So it's this combination of action thriller with Dan Stevens trying to rescue his sister and a cult thriller where <laughs> there's actual demonic going going on so trying to get to the bottom of of why this island is what it is and it's it's the thing is the problem with the apostle is that it's too long it is gareth evans is his own editor i really wonder what the 100 minute cut movie looks like it's over two hours as it is and it drags it drags in ways i think genuinely hurt the film but it is uh splattery it is scary it is an atmosphere that can't be beat if you're a fan of like classic british horror it has that tone, except that like, it pauses to have people get torn in half <laughs> in classic, yeah. ultra-violent ways. I mean, it's it's as violent as the Raid movies, but in a very different way. I think this is one of the coolest movies I've seen this year. Uh, it's coming to Netflix. Netflix produced this movie, so you'll be able to see it later this month. And it's a lot of fun, but I do think you should definitely be prepared for the slowdown. Don't expect the Raid. And just be ready for uh, Dan Stevens giving a great performance where he's just this unhinged opium addict just running around this island punching people in the face, trying to find his sister, battling supernatural evil. It's its its a lot of fun. See, sometimes when a film plays at a film festival, they, they you know, will re-edit it or reassess the edit of the film based on the uh, the feedback. And hearing you talk about this, I, I almost wish they could cut it down. But knowing this is Netflix and it's being released in less than two weeks, in October 12th, um, you know, that's probably unlikely. To, to happen so we're probably going to see the cut that you saw on our small screen on October uh, October 12th I'm not sure if I said that October 12th um, yep. let's talk about your next film uh, that is after the screaming stops yeah this took me by surprise this was a movie I saw because I had an empty slot I'd seen other things in a slot already I thought oh I'll go check it out if it's good I'll stick around if it's bad I'll just hop out and go get some work done and I, <laughs> this movie kind of bowled me over it is a documentary uh, from Joel Perlman and David Sutar. And it requires an introduction for me as an American. In the in the 80s, there was a British boy band called Bros, uh, fronted by Luke Goss and Matt Goss. And they were famous for 15 minutes. They, they sold out stadiums. They were chased through the streets like it's Beatlemania. They sold 10 million albums. And then one day, Bros vanished. And the film picks up 28 years later with Luke and Matt reuniting uh, for a bros reunion concert in England and they haven't spoken to each other in years and they've grown to be very different people. Luke Goss is an actor. He's in tons of B-movies and directed video action schlock, but he's also been uh, in Hellboy 2 and Blade 2. He's like a genuine presence, a very intense guy. And meanwhile, Matt Goss has uh, taken up a residence in Las Vegas. He performs a regular show there and he's very much a spiritualist. <laughs> we first meet him talking about his crystals in his apartment and as Matt and Luke come together, the movie flashes back and forth between them preparing for this concert and between the story of how bros fell apart. And I was engrossed because Luke and Matt are such amazing characters. And it plays out like this is Final Tap meets Kirby Enthusiasm. It's just uh, these, and it's, but it's real. And these two brothers who are constantly bickering and fighting, and they couldn't be more different. Uh, Matt Goss is one of my, is so funny unintentionally. He says the dumbest, craziest things, and Luke Goss just reacts and stares at the camera as <laughs> Jim Halpert's from The Office style. And the the, the, the dynamic between the two of them uh, is so crazy and sweet, and. They're brothers to the end. I mean, uh, as anybody who's ever had a brother or, or even a sibling is going to see themselves in these two. And this is a rare concert movie where I was not won over by the music. The music from Bros is bad. It's bad in the flashbacks. <laughs> it's bad in the reunion concert. But I was, but as a portrait of brothers finding common ground despite growing into being very different people, I was so moved and I laughed so much because Matt and Luke are like a natural comedy team unintentionally. Interesting. And that is after the screaming stops, and that, that is being distributed by who? Uh, BBC, uh, I believe, is distributing it in the UK. It does not have distribution in the States, as far as I know, but it was one of the runner-ups at the Audience Awards this year, which does not necessarily mean it gets distribution, but it means people really liked it, and it's on the record that, that people really liked it. So I think that <laughs> I think we'll see it in some capacity. Next film on your list is Standoff at Sparrow Creek. Tell us about that. 
This is the directorial debut of writer-director Henry Dunham. And this is going to sound hyperbolic, and I'm afraid it's going to be hyperbolic. I'm afraid it's going to set expectations in the wrong way. But watching Stan House Barrel Creek, I felt like I was watching Quentin Tarantino's Reservoir Dogs back in 1991 when it first came out. I feel like this is the arrival of someone who could be huge, someone who could have such a unique voice and someone who could, like, really change a lot of things. No, uh, I, I thought when you were prefacing this with, uh, or prefacing this with, uh, you know, this could sound hyperbolic, I was like, oh, you're not going to say anything hyperbolic. <laughs> and you totally said something very hyperbolic. <laughs> yeah. It's it's still very much a first film. It's rough around the edges. It's not perfect. I have pacing issues. There are there are problems with it that I, that are, that I can't get into without talking spoilers because they're very inherent to the way the film concludes. But this is really exciting, small cinema. And... The basic premise of this is that there are these – there's a militia group uh, living – I think it's in Michigan, and there's a mass shooting on a, on a police funeral. And the militia group meets together, realizes that one of their own committed the mass shooting. And essentially a, a one-location film is one member of the militia group, who is a former cop, must interrogate all of his other fellow members – to find out who committed the mass shooting so they can give them up to the cops before the cops use as an excuse to raid them and destroy their operation. So you're already dealing with these characters who are literally right-wing extremists. They're terrorists. The movie does not shy away from this. But it also doesn't, it doesn't like, pause to, pick, to cast judgment in a way that I think made people uncomfortable at the fest. It doesn't, like, wag its finger at these characters. It just puts you in this viper's den with these very dangerous, very bad people who talk in very fast, very stylized dialogue that was a pleasure to listen to. And it's James Badge Dale, uh, one of those character actors who just I always like watching, and he's popped up in three films of Fast Fest this year. Um, he's, he, this is the only one where he was a lead, though, and he was he's just great. He's just this um, weary former cop, um, and uh, who is rather than do anything else, he said, "I'm going to live in the wilderness with machine guns and crazy people," <laughs> and he's trying to just decipher which. Of these people, all of whom would gladly have gunned down a bunch of cops, trying to figure out which of these murderers is the murderer they need to give up to the cops for for their own survival. And it's lit so dark, people are practically silhouettes the entire time in a way that works. The dialogue reminds me of David Mamet, and that's just a sort of rat a tat, um, straight to the facts, extremely fast rapport going on. And I think people will have a lot to say about this movie when they, when they see it because. It does not try to apologize for the politics of his characters, but also doesn't say that they're heroic in any way. So um, I just want people to see this movie. I think it's I think Henry Dunham is going to be around for a long time. And where can people find this film? No idea. No distribution yet, as far as I know. Uh, uh, let's move on to your next film, which is the uh, third film from the director of Blue Ruin in Green Room. This one doesn't have a color. In the in the title, <laughs> it's uh, "Hold the Dark." It is "Hold the Dark," and I'm going to correct you there, Peter. It is the fourth film from uh, oh. Jeremy Saulnier. Oh, is it? Uh, yeah, he directed a movie called um, "Murder Party" years ago. And unlike any of their movies, "Murder Party" is a comedy. It's yeah. a very good dark comedy, but nobody's seen it. I think it's streaming on Amazon. It really is worth your time. I had no idea. <laughs> oh yeah, it's really good. But "Hold the Dark" is very much in line with his later movies in some ways. Uh, but it is if you're going in expecting. Something like Green Room, you may be let down because Green Room, as gnarly as it is, as violent as it is, as intense as it is, is still ultimately a, a movie that's, that's fun to watch. It's a thriller. It's about watching this, these those that those punks get those Nazis back. You know, Hold the Dark is a challenging movie. It is it is a little harder to watch. Its violence is never fun. Its violence is always treated with horror and with respect. And the gist of this movie is that uh, Jeffrey Wright of Westworld and many other movies plays the lead role of a wolf expert who travels to Alaska to assist a woman whose child has been hunted down and killed by a wolf. And she wants him to kill it. He's there to investigate and things derail in ways that are very horrifying to watch. And I don't want to say more than that. This movie is out now. It's a Netflix movie. It's, it's streaming right now. And it's even in limited release in some theaters. And Jeremy Saulnier is just, immediate master of his craft. He's so young. He's making movies that feel so mature and so like they were made by a man twice his age. And this is very much along the lines of No Country for Old Men. It wants to explore humanity. It explores why we hurt each other, um, why we do violence. 
And it's the second film on this list to feature James Badge Dale in a major role uh, as a cop who uh, Jeffrey Wright teams up with when things start getting especially awful. And there is a shootout about halfway through this movie that is uh, bleak and unrelenting and so hard to watch. Uh, like I, I interviewed Jamie Salmi in an interview that will go up on the site soon. And we talked about this, about how when violence on the cinema in cinema is inherently romantic, when like a shootout is, by, is exciting just by being a shootout, how do you make a uh, a gun battle where you want it to end because you're tired because you don't want people to get hurt where it's tiresome in the right ways you you're, you're exhausted by it and i feel like that the scene sums up hold the dark very well it's a violent film where the violence is treated not as catharsis but as something that we cannot comprehend or understand and we cannot understand why we hurt each other as human beings but it keeps on happening it's not easy to digest. It, it did not sit this high on my list when I first watched it. It took a few days for me to sit with it and think about it for me to feel comfortable um, saying it's an excellent movie. Uh, but it really is a film worth your time if you, if you have the stomach for it and you are willing to meet it halfway and understand that it's not there to please you or have a fun time. Okay, the next film on your list, do you pronounce this Tomb Bad? I believe it's Tomb Bad. I've been saying Tomb Bad around the fest. Yeah, uh, this movie sounds insane. <laughs> you know, just reading the description. So tell us what, what this movie is for people who don't know. Okay, Tomb Bad is an Indian horror movie, um, and it is insane. It is about a a young boy who inherits an estate in uh, early 20th century India, and the estate sits above a tomb of sorts where an ancient evil or ancient um, god lurks and it grant, grants him great wealth uh, but it comes at a cost and this all sounds maybe a little derivative at first I don't, I don't, I don't know how much you're reading there Peter because I don't want to say too much huh. because this movie the is synopsis on IMDb Pro says it's a mythical mythological story about a goddess who created the entire universe <laughs> that is true. The the um the, the tomb beneath Which this is not in... anything of what you just described. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that description is really odd because that is yes, there is a uh, ancient being that created the entire universe that figures prominently in this story. Uh, but part of the movie's fun. The reason why I'm rating it so highly is how it rolls out its reveals and how it takes its time getting to that point. And. Too bad is a movie that's uh, so dripping in atmosphere and so so frightening, and it, it spans thirty years. It's very much a generational horror epic. And uh, director, um, um, I apologize, to our Indian listeners, uh, Rahi Anil uh, Barve does something really interesting here, which is the story, basic structure of the story, the idea of um, a story told in three distinct chapters spanning thirty years about an ancient about a pact with an ancient. Uh, evil that corrupts and leads to um, an entire family dynasty falling apart. This is all stuff that I've seen before in lots of um, late uh, 19th century, early 20th century um, stories by like Richard Kipling, uh, Robert E. Howard, all these uh, weird fiction authors, H.P. Like Lovecraft, who have this sort of inherently white imperialist leaning. So to see Tomb Bad, a, a movie that deals with imperialism because it's set during the, an age where, where, where Great Britain um, had uh, controlled India to see this movie that's not only about imperialism, but borrow the structure of these imperialist writers, these, these imperialist horror writers, and make it its own, and make it distinctly Indian, and make it so it can't be separated from its place and time and location. It's a really special, really cool movie for that reason alone. And then you toss in great monsters, great scares, a just beautiful cinematography that really takes you to its time and place. It's a very wet movie. It's always raining. It's always dreary in this, <laughs> in this corner of India. And I just had this is my film of the fest. I think that I feel like kind of flew under the radar. I think a lot of people saw Indian movie, and I think uh, Americans unfairly have this view of Indian films where they're too long and maybe a little too silly. And I think we we confuse Indian filmmaking with Bollywood. Bollywood's its own thing. Too bad is feels so slick and modern it feels like a it feels like a del toro movie I feel like Guillermo del toro made a film set in india and that's the highest praise i can possibly give it um very cool uh let's move on to your next film we are now approaching the top uh what six uh your next film is destroyer yes destroyer the uh new film from karen kusama who directed the invitation a few years ago the 
marketing push on Destroyer has been Nicole Kidman, who stars in it, and her transformation, because she is under a lot of makeup. This movie playing a very hardened, very weary woman, a police detective who lived a very hard life. And the crazy thing about this performance is that Nicole Kidman's actual performance is as good as that makeup. It is... It's very much a tool for her to bring this character to life as opposed to an excuse for her to look like she does. And I think that's a very important distinction. I mean, there are so many uh, roles these days where an actor gains weight or an actress looks looks not like herself. Uh, but her performance really is the centerpiece here. And she is excellent. And I don't know how much I want to say plot-wise. It's just, at first, this feels like a story you've seen before where there is a detective who was wronged by a criminal years earlier. The criminal comes back to Los Angeles. She hunts him down. And the movie is essentially a series of vignettes where Colgan's character, Aaron Bell, uh, finds one thread, falls into its conclusion, uh, beats the hell out of whoever she needs to to get find another thread, falls that thread. And, and it's us following her on this investigation beat by beat. Uh, and, and as she does this, uh, we see her relationship with her family has fallen apart. We see that her relationship with her partner is, is non-existent. Uh, we see that she's uh, not really a good cop. She's just a, a tough, a violent one. And like The Invitation, uh, the, the previous film from Karen Kusama and the same screenwriters, things don't really come together until the end. Things don't really make sense until the end when um, there are reveals that recontextualize everything you've seen in ways that make it profoundly unsettling and even heart-wrenching. And the story was a movie I wanted to watch as soon again as soon as it was, as it was over. I was I was on board for the whole thing. Then the conclusion happened, and all the final puzzle piece clicked into place. And uh, I want to go back now and revisit it and see how it all came together so fluidly and look for the clues and details I missed the first time. It is a movie that. I think people will write off as being Nicole Kidman puts on ugly makeup and does a remake of Heat when it's so much more than that. It is a very fascinating, very chilly movie with a really incredible Nicole Kidman performance at the center of it. Okay, and your next film, The Perfection, is this, is this the film uh, with Allison Will- Williams? It is. It's uh, Allison Williams uh, from Girls and Get Out. And... It's directed by one of the from by Richard Shepard, who directed a lot of episodes of Girls, which is how this project came together, and does not have distribution yet. And it's killing me because this movie is this movie is incredible, Peter. Uh, based on your own frame of reference, the best way to sum up the perfection is it is either Brian De Palma uh, at his at his height making a Lifetime movie, or it is America finally making a proper South Korean movie. Is one of those two descriptions. I'm not sure which one is more accurate, hmm. but it, it is a movie that is unbelievably sinister until it is unbelievably funny, and it is, and then it manages to be both at the same time. The basic gist here is that Allison Williams plays a former cello prodigy who, for years earlier, left her um sc- her school and her mentor uh, for for reasons that are explained throughout the movie. And then she reunites uh, with her mentor and her her replacement, more or less, the, the new uh, cello prodigy who's who has the fame and wealth that she thought she would have years ago, played by Logan Browning from uh, Dear White People, among other things. And these two strike a relationship. And at first it's romantic, and then it is something else. And the rest of the movie is seeing where Allison Williams and Logan Browning take these characters through one of the most unbelievably twisted plots I've ever seen in America or international cinema. If you've seen a lot of South Korean movies, like I saw the devil, uh, you will be maybe prepared for where this goes. It goes to dark places and wild places. And it keeps asking you to buy into this plot as it gets more convoluted and more insane and wackier. It, it's, it should be a cartoon and at times it veers on being a cartoon, but the movie is so assured and so aware of what it is and is so capable of leaning into its own trashy impulses that I had so much fun watching this. This is one of the big discoveries of the fest for me. And I, I'm really hoping that somebody at some studio is listening to me right now or has read our review <laughs> on the site because this movie is a total blast. After, like cult classic in the making. It's people are going to watch this movie like at home on Netflix in years from now and say, what did I just watch? What was that? Why did people make that? And then want to watch it again. It is, 
It's a crazy movie, Peter. It is insane. <laughs> um, your the next movie on your list, the night comes for us is is uh, number four on your list. Uh, tell us about that one. Night comes for us is the second uh, Timo Tahanto movie. Uh, the Indonesian director who did May the Devil Take You, and this one was uh, made by Netflix. So you'll be able to see it this month. I believe it's October nineteenth. Uh, I'll double check that. And um, yeah, look at it right now, October nineteenth. You will want to make this appointment viewing. You will want to see this with friends. You will want to not hesitate watching Night Comes for Us. This movie is two hours of Indonesian people destroying each other in fights. If you thought the raid had a lot of action, The Night Comes for Us is perhaps the most action-filled movie I've ever seen. And with that, the most violent film I've ever seen. This isn't like Jackie Chan, let's have fun with stunts type action. This is Indonesian men with machetes chopping each other bits for two hours action. And it's it, it manages to be fun while it does that, even though they, you know, it feels like everybody in this movie is Jason Voorhees for the amount of punishment they take and can dish out. It is um, the plot is very very bare bones. It is high ranking uh, criminal assassin uh, chooses not to kill a little girl when he's ordered to do so, and then must uh, face the wrath of of all the people who come to kill him for making this choice. And it's very much a mini the raid reunion. Uh, Joe Taslim is the lead character. He was in the raid, and Iko Iwais from the raid and the raid two is the main villain, and he is the guy who's coming uh, after his old friend. It must. Um, kill him for um, trying to save his little girl. And this movie is all fists, it's all blades, it's all, it's all machine guns. It is two hours long, and it pauses from the action for maybe 20 minutes in the middle. Most of this movie is just non-stop, bone-breaking, head-splattering, neck-snapping craziness. And it's all staged in ways that make me wonder how many people must have actually died making this movie. I don't think anyone actually did. But there are stunts in this movie that... that feel like uh, Timo Tohanto and his team watched The Raid, which is an Indonesian <laughs> film made by a Welsh man, and say, okay, he defined what an Indonesian action movie can be. Let's take it home. Let's, let's actually actually have an Indonesian filmmaker outraid The Raid. And The Raid's probably a better movie. It has more clear characters and a better story. But the Night Comes for Us is by far the crazier, bigger, louder, bloodier movie. And when I left this movie, I gathered in a quiet circle with a bunch of other film writers. We just stare at each other in slack-jawed disbelief at what we had seen. We all had never seen the action movie like this before. I feel like this is going to be the discovery that's going to, like, people are going to shift on. The same way that I feel like The Raid, all those years ago, I guess close to 10 years ago now, it was a movie where everybody said, oh, this is what action movies are now. I think this is what The Night Comes for Us is. Well, this is now on my list of <laughs> must-see films. Uh, do we know when this is coming out? Uh, yes, and Netflix on October 19th. And uh, the next film on your list is a film called Border. Border is a very interesting movie to talk about because the Fantastic Fest guide was intentionally vague on it. Pretty much gave the bare bones plot description, which is a woman working as a border agent in, I believe it's uh, Sweden, uh, encounters a strange individual and they strike up an odd relationship. Um, and made more interesting because they both are... Let's not be bone. Let's not just beat around it. Uh, they're both very ugly people, and they both have strange, possibly supernatural abilities. Huh. And it's a film by the by the uh, the same man who wrote the novel Let, Let the Right One In, wrote the short stories it's based on. He wrote the screenplay and has that sort of same vibe, sort of uh, very grounded magical realism of Let the Right One In, where it deals with supernatural elements and creatures and folklore in ways that feel like it take place in the real world. Uh, but whereas Let the Right One In was ultimately a very disturbing movie, I feel like Border is ultimately very hopeful in ways that I found very surprising and really strangely romantic. It has the best sex scene I've seen in years, and you're not prepared for it, I'll say that much. Uh, but if I if someone had told me what the reveal was, what was actually going on in Border, I would have like rolled my eyes so hard they would have fallen out of my head, and I would have never have seen it. Uh, so I'll, just, I'll leave it here and say it's just this beautiful, romantic magical special movie about what it means to find your place and find someone who you're compatible with in uh, uh, in ways that are supernatural and at the same time very relatable there are aspects of border that are incredibly outrageous but i found the humanity in them and i found myself understanding understanding these characters 
who are not quite human in ways that are profoundly human, if that makes sense. This movie really flattened me. I was moved to tears by it. Yeah, and this film won uh, Uncertain Regard in at the Cannes Film Festival uh, earlier this year and is being released by Neon. comes out uh, later this month, right? I believe so, yeah. Neon does have it. I would recommend staying away from synopses and reviews because if people if I, I i think that people will, will be turned off if they knew what this was about i i genuinely believe that and it's not it's not the, the film's fault but i feel like like i was googling some research for an article i was writing and what's about was pretty much splattered across a, a variety story in the headline and it's it just i get why it, it's there it's the hook for the movie but it's not a good hook it's a hook that i'm glad it's not up on me because i would not have taken it seriously Okay, so uh, don't read too much into Border. Just go see it. The next film on your list, number two of your fest. Uh, this is a film Brad talked about, uh, I think, last week on The Water Cooler. One Cut of the Dead. Uh, this is another film, I think, at least judging from what he said, you don't want to find out too much about it. Yeah, I won't say too much. I will tell you the amusing thing about this was when the programmer came to introduce the film at Fantastic Fest. He said he recalled the story of getting the screener uh, last year. It's a Japanese movie, and the email of the screener said, "Please watch till the very end." And he started watching it, and ten minutes in, turned to his wife and said, "There's no way we're programming this. This is not getting in." And then by the end of the movie, he was thrilled and had to immediately email back and say, "We want this movie no matter what." And this <laughs> is a Japanese film from director uh, Shinichiro Ueda, and the basic premise is a low-budget zombie movie uh, production is attacked by actual zombies. And the entire movie uh, is shot in one shot, a.k.a. one cut of the dead. And I don't want to say more than that, because that's as much as I knew going in. And for the first chunk of this movie, you're watching a pretty middling zombie movie. It has pretty low-grade effects. The humor doesn't really sell. The characters are pretty one-note. It's just a really trite boring not particularly well-made zombie movie and then the turn happens and then everything clicks then you say oh my that's what i was watching and then it becomes a film that had the entire audience roaring with approval uh it sounds like a cliche but like my audience roared with laughter and with cheers and were buzzing this movie, we won the audience award it, when the audiences leave a movie at fantastic fest or at most film festivals they do a ballot and then everything is sort of uh uh, counted up, and the movie that uh, won the most approval with audiences won the audience award. The One Cut of the Dead, a movie with a first 30 minutes that is hard to get through, uh, took home the top prize from the crowd. And the crowd was right. And I was so concerned that I was just feeding off the audience, that I was, that I was just feeling that energy, that I went home with a screener copy at home. I watched it in my living room with my wife and two friends just to make sure I was not crazy as the movie was some kind of masterpiece. <laughs> and it played just as well at home a second time through, even when I knew what was coming. Um, but so but the, I thought, the problem with a film like this is, though, how do you market it? You, without... I, that's the question. I, I have no idea. And any trailer will have to give away what makes it special. And so I don't, I don't know. Right now it doesn't have American distribution. I, can't, I imagine it at some point will hopefully be picked up. But if you have the opportunity to watch this without knowing anything about it, please do it. Because you're in for something special. This is to even tell you what it reminds me of would be saying too much. And it, and <laughs> people have worked too hard at Fantastic Fest to protect what the secret was before the movie screened for me to just spoil it here. So I won't. But I have I have rarely experienced such joy. This is yeah. <laughs> this is such a great movie. And if it hits theaters, uh, American theaters this year, which I don't think it will, it's a shoe in for my top five of the year. And maybe, maybe people will discover this as a tile on one of the streaming services on your TV, and you just click on it and uh, get that same discovery that you got. But I, I, I kind of worry, even in that scenario, that people would kind of tune out in the first yeah. you know half hour. Yeah, if you put this movie on in the first half hour, if, if I put it on Netflix and watch the first 15 minutes, I would have said this is garbage and turned it off. I straight up would have done that. And uh, yet it's the number two film you saw at this festival. And, and yet, and yet, and yet, yet, because... The movie would not be able to work if the first half hour was not the way it was. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Um, 
And you know that, that that's something saying about seeing movies in theater versus seeing movies at home. And I, it, there's been a ton of film festival movies, not maybe the reaction as uh, <laughs> as big as uh, this film for you, I guess, um, in terms of like you know hating the first you know 15 minutes. Uh, but there's been many movies that I wanted to like leave or just I just knew I wasn't gonna like and you know won me over. And there's something about saying about you're trapped in that theater with all these other people and you really can't leave versus, you know, watching something on streaming where you just have the power to press stop and menu and go to something else. Um, but, uh, let's, let's move on to your number one film of fantastic fest. What is it? My favorite film of fantastic fest this year was Luca Guadagnino's remake of Suspiria. And I approached this with some trepidation because the original Suspiria, the Dario Argento film from 1977, is one of my favorite horror movies of all time. And what Guadagnino does that's special is that he doesn't remake Suspiria. As he says in his introduction to the film um, before our screening, he tried to capture the feelings that he had of watching Suspiria as opposed to making a direct remake. Because there's no point in remaking a movie that, that distinctive. And the premise is still the same which is that an American dancer goes to a dance academy in Berlin, Germany, and finds supernatural shenanigans afoot. But what makes this movie so fascinating is that it is a full hour longer than the original Suspiria. It is two and a half hours long compared to 90 minutes. And yet it reveals the original film's biggest secrets and surprises in the first five minutes. So it's almost like it's saying the entire movie, the entire original movie, everything they built up to, here it is in the opening scene, now let's do our own thing. And it really does its own thing. It's so evocative of its time and place. It's set in 1977 in Berlin, which is when the original movie came out. And it uses the politics of a divided Berlin of the time to really drive the story, to explore ideas of rebellion and feminism, and then just go straight into the horror uh, of it all. And then it's also balancing uh, commentary on post-World War II Europe and the Holocaust and lingering guilt and when one generation needs to cede control to the next. And it's doing all this while being this really gnarly, really entertaining, really gruesome horror movie. Uh, I mean, if you're looking for something that's, that's instant gratification, something that's you know going to move at a steady clip, something that's going to offer you answers on, on, on a plate, which is something people want from horror movies, and that's fine. This is not that. This is very much an art movie. It's very much an art house experience. It takes a sweet time. It focuses in on details. It will never uh, let you leave a scene without a question about wh why things are happening. But I found the entire thing just intoxicating. I felt drunk watching it in the best way. I was intoxicated by the atmosphere, by the performances. Dakota Johnson and Tullis Winton in particular are excellent. And by the time the movie does go pretty nuts and it's back 30 minutes, I was so invested in this world and in its characters and in trying to piece together the, the, the thematics of it. Like this is a puzzle movie, not in the sense where things are told out of order or in the sense of, um, of trying to piece together things mystery box style, but it's a puzzle movie in that it wants you to grapple with its themes in ways that I think most genre movies don't. It is, Asking questions, not giving answers, but leaving enough evidence for you to have those meaty late night discussions that the best movies always demand. And after a lot of conversations, I've started to realize that I may not be the best person to write about um, Suspiria, but I am the right person to evangelize for it and to, to tell you to seek out our review on the site uh, by Marissa Mirabel, who had a more personal reaction to it. I think that uh, women in particular at Fantastic Fest seem to be really taken with what the movie is saying. Uh, it is a movie that's uh, even directed by a man. It is about women, and the entire cast is entirely women. Even the, the only main male character of note is played by Tilda Swinton in heavy makeup. Uh, it is So it's, it's, it's even in, in, in a meta sense, in the sense of outside the movie, it is trying to be a tribute to women and what they're capable of. It also features lots wait, wait, and lots wait, wait, of crazy wait, but violence. Did, didn't the director deny that? Oh, he did, but it, it is indeed, it is indeed <laughs> Tillis Witten in makeup. Jeez. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm fearing that I'm going to be the one person that doesn't like this movie. 
I oh, this, this movie this movie's the anti Peter. Peter, it, it is yeah. the anti you. It is everything that will frustrate you and drive you crazy. <laughs> uh, I want to be excited for this movie, but I feel I don't know. Uh, well, they can read all of your Fantastic Fest diaries on the site. We'll link them in the show notes. Uh, you did one what like every day of the fest, right? Yeah, I wrote eight articles where I. I wrote a little bit about every single movie I saw. So all 28 movies, these 15 plus 13 more, all on the site, including some thoughts on the two other big premieres, Overlord and Bad Times of the El Royale, both of which are perfectly fine, and I recommend you see them, but neither of them are good enough to make this list. Really? Um, yeah. Actually, talk about those pretty briefly. Um, uh, yeah. Let's talk about Overlord, El Royale. For, or, oh, yeah. El Royale? Okay. Yeah, okay. Let's talk El about Royale. That Bad Times El Royale this is the new film from Drew Goddard, director of The Cabin in the Woods. And it is uh, a Tarantino-esque thriller set in the 70s about a group of strangers all at a, who all arrive at a hotel in the middle of nowhere on the border between California and Nevada who um, have one very bad night together as their secrets spill to the surface. When I first watched this, I wasn't too warm on it. I thought it was okay. It has a really great cast. Uh, Cynthia Erivo uh, is the small, probably the smallest name in the cast, and she's great. She's fantastic. Uh, and she holds her own against people like Jeff Bridges and Chris Hemsworth. And when the movie gets where it's going, it's um, I felt, I felt a little, little let down by the destination. I feel this, this first half where it's setting up these pieces and maneuvering these characters into place, I was really excited to see where it went. Yeah. But then there's the extended third act. Like I'd say maybe the last hour of the movie is the third act, and it's set in one scene. I just wasn't feeling it. I wasn't on board with where it was taking me. I don't think it was as tense or as horrible or as exciting as it needed to be. And I've talked to some people since then who have convinced me to see it again, who have convinced me that maybe there's some thematic undercurrents here that I'm not appreciating. But as a thriller, I think it's only pretty good. Yeah, I I also saw this film, and it's... that I think you're right. That first half is so compelling, trying to figure out why all these people are here. They're all here with like other motivations and there's strange stuff going on and figuring out, uh, you know, figuring out all that stuff is kind of very much a lot of fun. And, uh, it's shot in a fun way. Like there's these good, uh, one shots and, uh, it's well acted. But once you get to that second half, when everything is kind of figured out and it's, you know, set up the battlefield, if you will, for, you know, the confrontation. I feel like that's not as interesting. And I think it also might be uh, some expectations that have been built up by Cabin in the Woods, which kind of had this bonkers third act. And uh, this film does not, you know, go in that direction at all. Yeah, I feel like temper your expectations uh, going into this one. I, I, I have a feeling I may like it more on a second go through when I'm more aware of what it is. Um, but I was expecting another Drew Goddard movie, <laughs> speaking of speaking from just Cabin in the Woods, and it's not that at all. And I feel like maybe that's, maybe that's unfair. Maybe the second viewing will allow me to suss out what's good about it and what I like more about it. But right now, uh, it, I was definitely a little let down by it. Yeah, um, and let's talk about that other film. Uh, J.J. Abram produced uh, Bad Robot film Overlord. Yeah, Overlord. This is a Julius Avery. Uh, this is his uh, first major movie. He's an Australian filmmaker. He previously directed Son of a Gun from 2014. And this is a movie about American paratroopers in the eve of D-Day who uh, very few of them survive leaving the plane. And those who do are tasked with destroying a radio communications tower in a small French town, only to learn their communication tower is built over a Nazi lab where all kinds of monsters, mutants, and zombies are being worked on and developed. So it's this World War II movie that evolves into a horror movie. Uh, and it's it's fun. I mean, I described it as if as if Paul W.S. Anderson still made good movies. I mean, I'm thinking of, like, it reminds me very much of Event Horizon and The Relic and those kind of late 90s creature features. Uh, it has that sort of similar vibe, except it has that that bad robot polish. J.J. Abrams wouldn't put the name on a movie that didn't look great. This movie looks great. The monsters are awesome looking. It splatters real good. There's tons of gore in this movie. It's unapologetically violent. It's an audience movie. It, it, audience it's the first it R-rated movie from Bad Yeah, Robot. yeah. Yeah, it's, it is unapologetically um, uh, a, a nasty, audience-pleasing, crazy exploitation movie. I, but at the same time, 
I'm not sure if there's anything to it beyond that. I think it's a good time at the movies, and I think that if you want to go in and see some um, um, some cool actors uh, like Wyatt Russell and Giovanna Depo, both of whom are very good, um, put on World War II soldier uniforms and then shoot their way through a bunch of monsters, it scratches that itch. It is very much an unapologetic, let's go punch Nazis in the face movie, which all for that in 2018. We need that. <laughs> um, but I don't think it's, it's as successful in terms of trying to feel like a real movie. <laughs> is that, that, maybe, let me rephrase that. It, it Part of the movie's intention is that it wants to be a World War II movie that turns into a horror movie. And it's never quite as successful as a war movie. And it spends a long time being a war movie before it reveals its hidden card and says, here are monsters. And that buildup does not, doesn't do the movie any favors. And when, when it does deliver, it is fun. But like I said, it is... Paul Davis Anderson levels of fun. It is not, you know, Star Wars uh, or other, you know, things you've seen J.J. Abrams' name on. It is very much a very silly, very entertaining B-movie where things and heads and bodies explode really, really well. Yeah. uh, And nothing more than that. Okay, well, we have gone way over our allotted time, but I think people are going to enjoy this because this really gets you to put some uh, lists on your... uh, your queue, your letterbox uh, watch list, or what, whatever you use uh, to you know keep an eye out for when it when it comes to theaters and streaming. Uh, Jacob, where can we find more of your work online? I'm on slashfilm.com every single day, and I'm on Twitter where I'm at Jacob S Hall. Uh, you can find me at Slashfilm on, on, on all social media. Uh, this podcast, Slashfilm Daily, is published every weekday on iTunes, Google Play, uh, Overcast, Spotify all the popular podcast apps. If you have a question for us, send it to peter at slashfilm.com. Please go write a positive review of this podcast on iTunes. Tell your friends, spread the word. We'll see you tomorrow.